We are continuing our sermon series called Sunday Classics, and we've been taking uh, Old Testament stories from God's Word, and, and many of them you may be familiar with, some of them maybe not so much, looking at those and then making applications for our life. And so uh, this morning we're going to do quite a bit of review uh, to try to get to where we're at, and I'm going to do something I've never done before. I'm going to preach a message out of the book of Haggai. Um, I, I, I've read it before and, and thought about it, but it just uh, but it's going to work this morning, maybe. So we'll see. It'll be an adventure together. So we, we've been talking for the last several weeks about the nation of Israel. And the nation of Israel, God took Abraham and said, out of you, I'm going to make a people. I'm going to make a nation. And so from Abraham came uh, the, the nation of Israel or the Jewish people. They, were in, they eventually went into captivity in Egypt. God brought them out uh, by the hand of Moses, brought them into the promised land. And then after they were ruled or, or judged uh, by different prophets and judges, they said, we want a king. And so they had the king Saul, and then he was rejected by God, and they got the king David. King David ruled and was a godly king, and then his son Solomon ruled. And then when Solomon died, Solomon's son comes to the throne, and the kingdom splits. It, it splits into a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom, but both of those kingdoms did what God told them not to do. They mixed with the inhabitants of the land, and in that they were led away uh, to other gods to worship false gods instead of worshiping Jehovah God. And really, as a nation, their sin became worse and worse. Not that there weren't people who still were faithful to worship God, but as a nation, they, they worshiped false gods and they were led astray. The prophet Jeremiah comes on the scene, and Jeremiah is warning the people about the judgment to come. But the people do not listen, and so Nebuchadnezzar, this, this great king uh, from Babylon, comes in, and he besieges the city of Jerusalem. He takes over. He sacks the temple of Solomon, takes away the articles of gold and silver and, and bronze that were used in the worship of Jehovah God, and he takes those to his own storehouse. It is at that time that they capture uh, some of the, the best and the brightest, and, and Daniel is a part of that. And we talked about Daniel last week. After a, a couple of kings, Persia takes over Babylon. But Daniel's still there, and it was under a Persian king that Daniel uh, was cast into the lion's den and, and that God protected him. And we talked about that last week. And so we come to this place that now for some 50 years, the Jewish people have been under captivity. First, the, the empire of Babylon, now the empire of Persia. The city of Jerusalem is a wreck. The walls have been destroyed. The temple itself has been destroyed. This once great building as a testimony to Jehovah God where worship took place, where the very presence of God dwelt is now its level. All of the gold and silver robbed of it. And the city of Jerusalem sits as a testimony to the false worship of the Jewish people and the judgment of God. And that is the scene when we come to the book of Ezra. Ezra and Haggai occur at similar times, but I want to continue to give you some background. And in Ezra chapter 1 and verse 1, it says this, Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all of his kingdom and also put it in writing. 
saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is among you, uh, who, who, easy for me to say, who is among you of all his people? May his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem, and whoever is left in any place where he dwells, let the men of his place help him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, besides the free will offering for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. Then the heads of the fathers' houses of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levite, with all whose spirit God had moved, arose to go up and build the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. And all of those who were around them encouraged them with articles of silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with precious things besides all that was willingly offered. So we know from last week, and if we read the uh, book of Daniel, we know that Daniel, as an old man, was still an an advisor, even in the the kingdom, the reign of Cyrus, uh, the Persian, who's mentioned here in Ezra 1. So Daniel is an old man, and, and it references here in Ezra the prophecies of Jeremiah, because Jeremiah called the people to repentance, but he also prophesied that, that, that Jerusalem would be captured, that the temple would be destroyed. But he said, but God will, God will allow you to come back, and God will allow the temple to be rebuilt. He prophesied this also. And so Ezra says, so that Jeremiah's prophecy would come true, this is how God was working. And so we have Cyrus make this declaration. And what he says is, he says, listen, Jews can go to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. And other Jews that aren't going to go, they can supply. And even uh, non-Jews, their, their friends can also give money, give supplies so that they can go and the temple can be rebuilt. And so in Ezra chapter 3, and we'll not take the time to read it, but the Bible says that the foundations of the temple were being laid. And that old men who had remembered the old temple were weeping. And that that these young guys who knew nothing of that are are rejoicing. And that the, the, the sound of the people could be heard from very far away. Because for a whole generation, they had never been able to go to a place and worship Jehovah. As they were commanded to as Jews, they were supposed to offer sacrifices. They were supposed to keep certain holidays. And they couldn't do any of that because the temple was destroyed. But the foundation was being laid and God was at work. And then we come to Ezra chapter 4. Ezra chapter 4 and verse number 1 says this. When the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the descendants of the captivity were building the temple of the Lord God of Israel, they came to to Zerubbabel and the heads of the fathers' houses and said to them, let us build with you. For we seek your God as you do, and we have sacrificed to him since the days of Asaphra, that guy, king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the heads of the fathers' houses of Israel said to them, you may do nothing with us to build a house for our God, but we alone will build to the Lord God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. Then the people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah. Interesting what happens here, right? The people who lived around Jerusalem that were not Jews, when they heard what was happening, their first tactic was to come and say, hey, let us help you. We we worship the same God you worship. Let us be a part of this. But it was the Jews' job to build the temple. Gentiles could come and worship, but they worshiped differently than the Jews did. And then as soon as they said no, the Bible says they tried to discourage them. 
But I thought they were excited about the temple being built. I thought they wanted to worship God. But they discouraged them. They troubled them in building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. They're trying to discourage the people. They're trying to stop them. And then what they do is they write a letter. They write a letter to the king and they say, Listen, these Jews have always been troublemakers. Go back and look at your history. They were always rebelling against authority. They aren't going to pay taxes. This is not going to be good that they are building the temple. And so in Ezra chapter 5, or excuse me, in Ezra chapter 4 and verse number 23, it says, Now when the copy of King Xerxes' letter was read before Rahum, she, Shimsha, the scribe, and their companions, they went up in haste to Jerusalem against the Jews and by force of arms made them cease. Thus the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, ceased, and it was discontinued until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Now Cyrus, the king, said, listen, you can build. But the people found another authority. They wrote a letter and they got a letter and, they, and they, they came up and they forced the people to stop. The foundation was laid, but that's where it ended. Oh, they offered some sacrifices and they kept some holidays and they were excited to start, but it literally never got off the ground. Never got past the foundations. And for 15 or 16 years, the foundations were there and nothing else happened. And then in Ezra chapter 5, it says this, Then the prophet Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Edo, prophets prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. So Zerubbabel, the son of Shittil, and Jeshua, son of Jazadak, rose up and began to build the house of God, which is in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with them, helping them. And so Ezra said that these two prophets came and spoke to them, and the people began to build again. And so this morning, we want to look at Haggai chapter 1. Now, Zechariah prophesied as well. Haggai has two chapters, 1 and 2. We're not going to look at chapter 2. We just want to look at this initial prophecy that this prophet Haggai made to the people. And we want to make some application to our own life today. And so in Haggai chapter 1 and verse 1, it says this. In the second year of King Darius, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came to Haggai, the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shittil, governor of Judah. So we have a, a couple of characters. Haggai is the prophet, and then we have this man, Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel is the governor of Judah. He is the political authority for the Jews in this area that, that included the city of Jerusalem. So he prophesied to Zerubbabel and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. So there's Zerubbabel and there's Joshua. Now this is obviously different than the book Joshua, that Joshua, right? Not confusing at all for us. We call him Joshua Jr. No, I don't. That's probably not right. But Joshua is the high priest, so he is the religious leader. So Haggai goes to the political leader and to the religious leader, and he prophesied, and this is what he says. Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, this people says. Now, this also, a little confusing, so let's break down verse 2. Haggai is a prophet. A prophet is one who came with a message from God. So Haggai says, thus speaks the Lord of hosts. So God says, and Haggai is going to give a message. 
And God says, this people says. And I don't even know if this is good English. But that's okay because it wasn't delivered in English originally. So God says, through Haggai, the people are saying this. This is what they say. The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. God says, listen, I know what you're saying. All the people are saying, you know, it's not, it's just not the right time. We know that it would be great if we could build a temple to God. We could worship him. We could offer sacrifices like he's commanded us to. But the timing isn't quite right. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet saying, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? Now, I was thinking about that. When you read this and it uses the phrase paneled houses. Now, I remember when I was, when I was a young boy, probably the first house I ever remember us living in as a family. We lived right up here on Green Mountain and my dad finished off our basement. We had an unfinished basement, not all of it, just uh, like a family room, a TV room, and put in the, the, the studs and the walls, and then we finished it off with paneling. It was the 70s. It was great. We also had, I remember this, I don't know why this sticks in my mind, but I remember down one wall we had a, a, the sewer pipe that comes down in your in your basement, you know that, and uh, when anybody flushes the toilet or takes a shower, you hear the sound, right? And we covered that with a beam that looked like wood but was made of styrofoam. These were the latest building innovations in the 1970s, I'm sure of it. So when I think of paneling, I don't necessarily think of the highest end building product. Matter of fact, my wife and I lived in Texas. We had a house that had paneling. And I remember the realtor was like, this is really nice paneling. He said that when he was showing us the house. And I was like, that's not really like a selling point to me. And we didn't love that paneling, did we? No, that house was dark. Oh, that house was dark. Some of it we like put wallpaper on or something and did some other stuff, but yeah. We really needed to rip the paneling off and put on drywall, but that seemed like a lot of work, so we just turned on lights. Um, so when you read this and you're like, these guys have houses with paneling, you're like, that doesn't seem so great. But that's not the situation in the time in which we're talking about here. This wasn't paneling like we think about. It's really the idea that they were able to finish their homes in, in, a, in, a, in a higher finished way. See, because for a lot of people, building a structure was just about shelter. But for these folks, they were able to finish their home. And we, we kind of get a glimpse of this in 1 Kings chapter 7. Uh, 1 Kings talks about the building that Solomon did. Solomon who built the, the, the original temple, this beautiful temple, but he also built himself palaces and houses. And it talks about one of the palaces that he built in 1 Kings 7 and verse 3, and it says, and it was paneled with cedar, Above the beams that were on 40, uh, live, 45 pillars, 15 to a row. Down in verse 7 it says, Then he made a hall for the throne, the hall of judgment, where he might judge. And it was paneled with cedars from floor to ceiling. So when Solomon built a temple, or built a, a palace, excuse me, and 
created a throne room where he would sit and he would judge and he would rule. And he w- that's obviously a place where he wants it to be impressive. It describes it as saying he paneled it. He used cedar to finish it. This was sort of the highest level of building. This is the granite countertops or the, I, I don't know. We, my wife is always watching these home shows and people are going in and they're like, I've got to have granite countertops and hardwood floors, and, but then there's shiplap. I don't understand what they're doing. Different shows, they're doing different things, but this was the top. And what God says through Haggai is you guys are building these beautiful homes, but the timing's not quite right to build the temple. You guys have managed to come out of exile back to Jerusalem, and your places are beautiful. But for 15 years, the foundations of the temple of God have sat, and you're like, well, the timing's just not quite right. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. He said, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. See, Jesus said, the worship, the service, your relationship with God Almighty needs to be your first priority, and everything else will fall in line. Jesus didn't say, you can't have a nice house. What he did say is, that shouldn't be your first priority. Jesus didn't say, you can't have a healthy bank account. You can't make money. You can't be successful in your career. You shouldn't be concerned about your relationships. It's not that we shouldn't do any of those things, but none of those things should be our top priority. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and everything else will be added to you. Everything else will fall into place. John put it this way in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15. He said, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father but is of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. The problem with the, the, belief, the, the people at Jerusalem is their priorities were out of line. They were building beautiful houses for themselves, but they they made excuses for not building the temple of God. In studying for this passage, I came across a quote. Benjamin Franklin said, I've never met a man who was good at making excuses that was good at anything else. And I thought, oh, I'm going to remember that for a while. Because they had time, they had resources, they had energy to invest in their own homes, but not in the temple of God. Think about your time. Think about what you make time for. You have time to pursue the activities you want to pursue, to watch and listen to the things that you want to watch and listen to, to read and consume the information you want to consume. But then you're like, I just cannot find time to get into God's Word. That's not a time issue. It's a priority issue. Now, you may not like some of Haggai's prophecy this morning. God's already kind of kicked me around this week, so I'm just giving it to you, okay? I don't want you to think that I'm standing up here going, I've got it together, you need to get it together. Listen, 
We all struggle with our priorities at times, do we not? We find the money. I mean, I'm already probably going to make you mad, so I'll just go all the way, right? We find the money to do the things we want to do. Oh, but I, you know, I, I just can't give to that, preacher. Jesus also said this in Matthew 6. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on the earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moss nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Listen, I just want to challenge you with this. I, I'm not going to spend any time, any more time talking about your treasure. I want to talk to you about your heart. Think with me what the priority of your heart is. Is the priority of your heart politics? Is it hobbies or sports teams that you're passionate about? Is it masks or vaccines? Is it, what is your heart? What do you spend your time thinking about, reading about, focused on? And does that have any eternal Value because Jesus said, Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Are you doing things that have eternal value, or is your heart with the temporary? What are you passionate about? What are you pursuing? And is it really of value? Listen, I, I have a lot of interests. I, I, there's things that I love to do. And I love to go to the mountains. And I love to spend time in different activities. But I want to make sure that I'm focused on things that have eternal value. And these Jews living in Jerusalem ha had their priorities out of line. Not only that, their passions were out of line. Haggai 1 continues in verse 5, and, and his prophecy continues to the people. He says, now therefore, this says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourself, but no one is warm, and he who earns wages Earn wages to put them in a bag with holes. You ever been there? I put all my money in bags with big old holes before. I know it was in there, and I'm just looking at the ground. Now, some of you, maybe you've never been there and you got plenty of money. I'm just telling you, I've experienced that. When I read that this week, I was like, oh. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts? Because of my house that is in ruins. While every one of you turns, runs to your own houses. Therefore the heavens above Above you withhold the dew, and the earth withholds its fruit. For I called for a drought on the land and the mountains, on the grain and new wine and the oil, on whatever the ground brings forth, on men and livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. A couple of things I want us to notice about this passage. Notice what he says in verse number five. Now, therefore, this says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Consider your ways. In verse six, then, he gives, he gives all of those illustrations. You eat, but you're, you, but you're still hungry. You drink, but you're still thirsty. You put your money in bags of holes. And then he says again in verse number seven, consider your ways. Think about what you do and why you do it. 
It's really this same idea of our priorities, but put in a different light and thinking about the things that we're passionate about. Now listen, that doesn't mean you shouldn't work, right? We need to work. The Bible actually commands us to work. You've got to work. You, we've got to earn money. We've got to have shelter and food and clothing. We've got to pay bills. It's not that we shouldn't be engaged in those things. But what are we focused on? What are we passionate about? Consider your ways. Think about your thoughts, your the way you spend your, 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 your thoughts, your mental energy, your physical energy. Notice that it uses the phrase here in verse number five, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts. That idea, the Lord of hosts, is really the Lord of armies. It's hosts of angels. And it identifies God as a leader of great armies. Three times in chapter one, it calls God the Lord of hosts. And five times in chapter two, Haggai refers to him that way, the Lord of hosts. Because think about all that, that the Jewish people have gone through. It, over the last several years, either in the lifetime of these people that were older or, or in the lifetime of their parents for the younger generation, that, that the Jerusalem, the temple had been decimated. They had been taken into exile. Now they have an opportunity to come back. They have an opportunity to rebuild. But there are all these political pressures What's the king, what, is, what are the kings going to say? And What about the local government? And what about the local residents? And Haggai says, I come and speak to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. The one who commands the armies of heaven. This is the God that we serve. We don't need to be fearful about what man is going to do. We serve the Lord of hosts. And notice what he commands there in verse number 8. He says, go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple. Now that's interesting when we understand some background. The original temple was not built with wood that was cut from the mountains around Jerusalem. The original temple was built with giant cedars that were purchased by Solomon from an area known as Lebanon. And originally, that's the way this new temple was to be built as well. If you go back and you look at Ezra chapter 3 and verse number 7, it says this. They also gave money to the masons and the carpenters. This is talking about when the people, Ezra 3 is when they're laying the foundations. This is when everything's going great. This is when they've got, they've got Cyrus the king's They've got his blessing, they've collected money, they've got resources, they're paying carpenters, they're paying masons, and food, drink, and oil to the people of Sidon and Tyre. Why? To bring cedar logs from Lebanon to the sea, to Joppa, according to the permission which they had from Cyrus, king of Persia. So they had permission, and they had the purchasing power to order these cedar trees, to come from Lebanon. Now you would assume if you paid for it, you got it, right? I mean, if you spend money on something, aren't you kind of watching to make sure you get it? I do. It's called Amazon, right? I get emails. 
And I look, oh, my wife's shopping. Oh, my daughter's shopping. Oh, my other daughter's shopping. Well, this is great. And I'll be honest, I don't pay a lot of attention to those orders. But if I order something, when's it coming in? Because when I order it, it's important. So here's my question. What happened to those cedar trees? What happened to the trees that they paid the oil and the food and the money for that came from Lebanon? They were living in paneled houses. What were they paneled with? And so God said, get up, get an ax, and start falling some trees. They needed to put their faith in action. And God also says in verse 8, Go up, start cutting trees, and build the temple that I, may take, that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. Listen, our goal should not be our own glory, our own progress, our, our own elevation. Our goal in putting God and his kingdom first should be his glory. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9, in this manner, therefore, pray. When he's teaching his, his, his disciples to pray. And, and he starts out the Lord's Prayer this way. Our Father, which art in heaven, what? Hallowed be thy name. Holy, exalted, glorified be the name of God. How many times have we said that, but do we do that? Are we looking to lift up the name of God? Are we looking to glorify God in the way that we live? Or are we more concerned about how people see us? I don't know what happened there in Jerusalem, but I know this. Cedar trees came from Lebanon, but they didn't end up in the temple because they had to go up in the mountains and cut some more trees. And how often does God bless us and God work in our life, but we take it for our own glory? Finally, Haggai finishes his prophecy this way. Or excuse me, Haggai finished his prophecy. This is the response in verse number 12. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shatil, and Joshua the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. And the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the presence of the Lord. Then Haggai the Lord's messenger spoke the Lord's message to the people, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shatil, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. A couple of things I want us to see as we close this morning. Number one, the people responded with obedience. See, the Holy Spirit can work in our heart. God can convict us. God can reveal to us how he sees us in some different areas, where our priorities aren't right, where our passions aren't right, where we're spending too much time, too much energy, too much effort on things that do not matter, and we are not as focused on the eternal as we need to be. God, through his Holy Spirit, reveals that to us, and then we decide how we're going to respond. Some people, they get angry about it. Well, how dare God get in my business? That's not going to end well for you, just so you know. Most of the time, you know what I think we do? We kind of justify it, put it away. We try to have good intentions, but we don't necessarily change a whole lot. 
But the people got up and they obeyed. They began to build. They began to put into action what they said they believed. British pastor named Jeffrey Studdard Kennedy said this. This quote has stuck with me this week as well. He said, faith is not believing in spite of evidence. Faith is not believing in spite of evidence, but faith, it's obeying in spite of consequences. He said that faith is obeying in spite of consequences. It's doing what God has commanded us to do, even if it doesn't seem like the wisest thing at the time. Even if we think it might cost us. Isn't that what Daniel did when he opened his window and he faced towards Jerusalem and he prayed knowing that there was an edict that he would be thrown in the lion's den? What sense does that make? But by faith he prayed anyway. When was the last time you did something just because God told you to do it? Not because you thought it would be best for you. Romans chapter 1 Verses five and six says this, through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. Verse five of Romans chapter one says this, that God has given us apostleship for obedience. God God sent Jesus because he loves us. He gives us salvation because he cares for us, but he also desires of us obedience. He wants us to follow him. He wants us to step out and do what he's commanded us to do, whether we fully understand it or not. The people responded with obedience, but they also responded with godly fear. says that Zerubbabel and Joshua, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. And it says the people feared the presence of the Lord. Now, we hear that word and we think, oh, well, God is love. I shouldn't be afraid of him. And I've thought about that this week and even spent some time meditating on this, but there, there, is, there is a healthy fear that we should have of God. And, the, and the, the, the way I think of it, the way I picture it, is when we understand the awesomeness of God, we can't help but be a little fearful. We, we trust God. The, the love of God, we trust the goodness of God, but we also, when we get a glimpse of the powerfulness, the bigness, the awesomeness of God, how could we not stand in fear of that? And the people, the people who had been so focused on their own houses, all of a sudden recognized what their priorities have been, and how they had failed God, and they feared in his presence. He's the Lord of hosts. Think about the things we respect and fear in our life, and is God, shouldn't God be at the top of that list? Not only did the people fear, but finally, God responded. I love this. Look with me at Haggai 1, beginning in verse 13. Then Haggai, the Lord's message, spoke the Lord's message to the people, saying, I am with you, says the Lord. And then it says that, the, that God stirred up the heart of Zerubbabel and Joshua and the people. When the people 
responded with obedience and fear. God responded. How? By saying, I'm with you. Now, he had not been with them. Think back to the prophecy of Haggai. And and the description is one of frustration, isn't it? You work hard, but you don't so much. You, You eat, but you're still hungry. You drink, but you're still thirsty. You put on clothes, but you're still, you're still cold. You make money, but you put it in a bag with holes. Your life is frustrating. You're working, but it seems like there's no fulfillment. There's no purpose because true fulfillment and purpose is found in, in putting Christ first, in putting God first, in being involved in, in the things that, that he is involved in, in doing things that have eternal value. When the people obeyed and when the people feared, then God said, I'm with you. I don't want to frustrate you. I, I, I want I want you to be successful. But he wanted him to be successful in building the temple, not in just what they wanted to do. I'll be honest with you, as I I studied this this week, I thought about Belmar Church. And the community we're in here in Lakewood and the western suburbs of Denver and, and Denver and the Front Range and, and Colorado and our country. And man, there's so many things that we can focus on that are not the way I would like them to be. But I believe God is calling us as a church to be at work doing eternal things, to seeing men and women who don't know Christ to come to know him as their savior. To see men and women be discipled and begin to grow in their faith that their lives and the lives of their children and grandchildren would be changed. And I'll be honest with you. Our world is a mess. But you know what? I'm not looking to midterm elections or some political party to right the ship. Our world is a mess. But as powerful as it is, we don't need the American military to to come to, to, to certain situations and make everything right. Our hope is in the Lord of hosts. Our hope is in God Almighty, and what we need is the lives of men and women transformed, your friends, your coworkers, your neighbors, and your family members. God desires to do a transforming work in their life, and guess what his plan is? It's you, and it's me, and that is work that has eternal value that is far beyond this life. And that needs to be our priority and our passion. You say, but preacher, there's this obstacle, there's that obstacle. Preacher, I'm scared. Preacher, I, I'm, I don't know what, everything that I should know. I know I'm not going to have the right words. But, 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 but listen, God is with us. Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. I want to close this morning with some verses out of Romans chapter 8. Verses that you've probably heard before but I want you to think of them in the context of the prophecy of Haggai. Romans 8 and verse 31 says this, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us 
all things. And then he says this in verse 38. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray this morning. Our gracious God in heaven, Lord, I pray that the prophecy of Haggai would pierce our hearts and our minds today. God, I pray that we would see the, the time that we waste, the energy that we waste on things that have no value in eternity. And I pray, God, that we would follow the example of Zerubbabel and Joshua, of the people in Judah and Jerusalem who obeyed the voice of God who feared God more than they feared the kings or, or the principalities or those who would seek to discourage them. And in that, God, you responded by being with them, by helping them to complete the great task you had given to them. And God, I pray that you would help us Help us, God, to obey you. Help us, God, to fear you. And help us, God, to be at work in accomplishing this great task of sharing Jesus and making disciples starting right here in Lakewood, Colorado. Use us, God. Let us see you work. And God, may you receive all of the honor and the glory. In Christ Jesus' name we pray, amen.